Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our second session, our second lesson from the book of Acts. Last week, we looked at the first eight verses in Acts, and we saw that Acts is a historical book telling the who, what, where, when, and sometimes why of all the things that happened in the early days of the church. It was the story of the men and women whom we call apostles today, who were uh, the leaders of the early church. We saw that Acts was written by Luke for the express purpose of setting out an organized and factual account of what had happened. And we saw that Jesus told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came upon them with power, in power, that they might be effective in being witnesses to him throughout the world. And that's a lot for just eight verses. If you miss it, it's still available on the YouTube channel. I encourage you to go check it out. Now, before we get into tonight's lesson, let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you and praise you so much for this opportunity to dig into your word. We thank you for the technology that you've made possible. We thank you, Lord, for uh, even for this situation, as, as frustrating as it is, as hard as it is to be isolated the way we are, it gives us an opportunity to look at things from a new perspective. And we thank you and we praise you for that. And we pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts to your word tonight as we study your book of Acts. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So we ended last time with Jesus gathered with a crowd of his followers at Mount Olivet to give them a set of instructions. And that's exactly where we pick up now. Imagine everyone looking at Jesus and listening to him with this intense focus. Verse 9 says, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. His followers had been through a lot. They first loved him and followed him and learned from him. They expected him to have a long life on earth and to lead a political uprising or a religious revolution or maybe both. But then he was betrayed and arrested. And they were shocked, but surely this would be when he would launch the revolution, right? Then he was sentenced and killed. Most of them didn't know what to think then. But then he came back, and he spoke with them, and he ate with them, and he gave them instructions. And that's the situation that they're in now as they're standing there, and they're finally beginning to get it who he really is. And as they watched, right before their eyes, he began to rise up into the air. Picture this. And he rose up into the air until he went into a cloud. It was covered by clouds. <coughs> Excuse me. I can picture the disciples standing there, watching him rise up, eyes wide open, mouths open, getting sunburned tonsils as they look up into the sky. And all of a sudden, these two guys show up. They weren't there a minute ago. They're not just ordinary guys. They're in bright, shining white clothes, and they just appeared out of nowhere. And they said, in essence, why are you standing around looking up into the sky? This same Jesus, he's coming back. And they said, look, someday he's going to come back the same way that he went up. We read in, in the book of Revelation, Revelation 1-7, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. And that's exactly what these angels, for that's what they were, said to the disciples as they stood there gaping up into the sky, looking up after Jesus. They're like, hey, he's coming back. He's going to come back the same way he left, but you've got work to do, so you don't need to be standing here looking up into the sky. Now, this idea of Jesus coming back wasn't new to the disciples. Jesus had prepared them for it before the crucifixion. John 14, 3, he said to them, specifically to these guys, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. 
And we shouldn't be surprised when Jesus fulfills his promises. Now, we don't know if the angels said anything else to the disciples or if they disappeared and maybe even rose up again into the heavens just like Jesus did. We don't know what happened. We don't know if they followed them back to Jerusalem, but we do know what the disciples did. They went back to Jerusalem. Jesus had promised them the baptism of the Holy Spirit not many days from now. <clears throat> and he had commanded them to wait and not leave Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came. So they went back to Jerusalem to wait. Verse 12 says, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. They all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication, with the women, and Mary the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So the disciples locked themselves in this upper room. If you were counting as I read the names, you should have come up with 11. It was all of the 12 disciples except for Judas who had betrayed him. And don't be confused about the name Judas that we read there. Judas, the son of James, in verse 13, is a different guy. Judas just happened to be a common name back then. I, I wouldn't be surprised if this guy wanted to change his name after what Judas Iscariot had done. But it wasn't Judas Iscariot. It was all 11 of the remaining disciples. And there were some others with them as well. The women that is referred to here, that are referred to here, are the women who had followed and supported Jesus. We don't have their names listed for us, but we can presume a few, probably Mary Magdalene, uh, maybe the other Mary who came to the tomb, Salome, who also came to the empty tomb, maybe Martha and Mary, the sisters of Lazarus, and of course, Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers, James and Joseph, who was also known as Jude. Um, these brothers of Jesus were an interesting addition because not very long before, they had said of Jesus, oh, he's crazy. They didn't believe he was the Messiah, but now apparently they did. And in fact, we know that they did because later on, both of these two brothers of Jesus would go on to write books of the Bible, James and Jude. Now, what were all of these people doing while they waited? Well, Jesus had said to wait, so they couldn't do much. Plus, it wasn't particularly safe to go wandering around Jerusalem. On top of that, if, if you had been told the Holy Spirit's going to come to you, but gather together and wait, you wouldn't want to be away when the Holy Spirit came. You wouldn't want to miss it. So how would you pass the time? How, what would you do while you're waiting for such an important event? Well, the Bible tells us what they did. It says they continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. That is to say, they didn't argue. They didn't, there was no dissension, no contention, no jockeying for position like they did when Jesus was alive, or at least some of them did while Jesus was still alive. Instead, they prayed and they laid their cares at the feet of God. That's supplication. And as we'll see in a minute, they searched the scripture. This is a great response when we're faced with, when we find ourselves waiting for God's timing. That's exactly what they were doing, waiting for God's timing. But they had a great response. This, is, this should be our response as well. Be patient, and in your waiting, pray, let God do the worrying, and search the scripture. We don't know the exact length of time that they were in that upper room, but we do know that it was quite a number of days. We'll come back to that in chapter two, but for now, uh, it might have been as long as a month that they were up there waiting for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So they prayed and prayed and prayed. This wasn't just a day or two. It was quite some time. And they studied and studied and studied. And at some point along the way, someone pointed out that they were one disciple short. Jesus had selected 12. 12 must be the number he wanted. But one of them had disqualified himself. Look at verse 15. It says, And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120. And said, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now, 
This man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that the field is called in their own language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate, and let no one live in it, and let another take his office. Verse 21, Therefore, if these men who had accompanied us, accompanied us all the time that Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism, and let me start that over from verse 21, Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. In other words, he said, somebody's got to replace Judas as one of the 12. Verse 23, and they proposed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, you, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and the apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, there are many things we could say about this episode in the history of the early church, and, and a lot of people have said a lot of things about it over the years. But for the sake of time, I want to focus on just a, a few things. First, wh what happened to Judas? Jesus chose him to be a disciple, and then he became a traitor. Did Jesus make a mistake? Well, obviously not. This is how I know that Peter and the other disciples searched the scriptures while they were in that upper room. Peter quoted from two Psalms, Psalm 69, 25, and Psalm 109.8. These psalms, along with a few others, are known as royal imprecatory psalms. Fancy words, but all it means is that these psalms were psalms about the king of Israel, but they also applied to the coming king of kings, the Messiah, who would also be the ultimate king. And these particular psalms had to do with the enemies of that king and what would happen to them. Now, Peter could have included one more royal imprecatory psalm, that was a strikingly clear prediction of Judas. It's Psalm 41, 9, where it says, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. So Peter's argument was that these things had to happen. These things that happened with Jews, Judas had to happen. It was part of God's plan, predicted in prophecy, and God will make those things happen. The second topic I want to talk about. Why did Peter and the others believe that they needed someone to take Judas's place? Well, the answer may be found in Matthew 19, 28. So Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. If the 12 disciples would one day sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel, then obviously there had to be 12 of them. Now, that may or may not have been the only reason, but certainly the disciples, both the capital D disciples and all of the other small d disciples, had become accustomed to the idea of the group of disciples as the 12. Having a vacancy on the 12 just didn't feel right. But Jesus personally chose the original 12, so how would they choose a replacement without Jesus? And that leads to our third topic. How did they choose a replacement? A lot of people over the years have criticized the disciples for making this replacement at all or for how they did it. But if we examine it more closely, I think we'll find some interesting insights. First, they set criteria. They probably asked the question, what do all of us disciples have in common? And they would have answered this. They had all followed Jesus and been taught by him. They had all witnessed his miracles, and those, most of them had missed witnessing his crucifixion. They had all seen the resurrected Christ, and they had witnessed, all of them had witnessed his ascension. So having been a personal eyewitness to all of these things was a prerequisite to being an apostle. 
and they ruled out Jesus's brothers, or that idea ruled out Jesus's brothers and a lot of others. Uh, Jesus's brothers had not followed him, had not learned from him, had not witnessed most of his miracles, uh, and uh, we don't know whether or not they witnessed his um, uh, resurrection, although they apparently did witness his ascension. But anyway, they were ruled out, the two brothers and, and, and a lot of others, and it, it pretty much boiled it down to these two guys remaining, Joseph, Barsabbas, Justice, and Matthias. Now, apparently, these two were pretty much equal in every way. They met all the prerequisites. They were equally dedicated to Jesus. They were equally equally well-liked among the other disciples and well-spoken and brave and courteous and whatever other criteria you want to, want to apply. The disciples may have even held a vote and it turned out to be a tie. Or, and we don't know this, but maybe it was the plan all along to choose multiple candidates and let God decide between them. Either way, that's what they ended up doing. They decided to draw lots. Now, a lot of people have criticized the choice of drawing lots, but drawing lots was a time-honored way of allowing God to decide. The Proverbs even talked about the casting of lots very positively. In Proverbs 16.33, it says, The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. On the other hand, this is the last time in the Bible that we see the casting of lots. Take that for what it's worth. What might be more telling is that people say, look, Matthias was chosen, but we never see him mentioned again in scripture. He obviously didn't do anything, but Paul, we see Paul as being incredibly important. Paul should really have been the 12th disciple. Well, at this time, Paul was just about to come in his, into his own as a persecutor of the church, as an enemy of Christ. And so he obviously is not a candidate in any way. Plus, he didn't meet all the other criteria that they had already set. So people say, yeah, but they just should have waited. Well, maybe so. But the argument about uh, about never reading the work of Matthias in the scripture uh, it, it, as one of the 12 is a poor one. The same could be said for Thomas, Andrew, Bartholomew, Matthew, and Simon the Zealot. In fact, this list of the disciples in the upper room is the last time we see any of them mentioned in scripture. And what about the other guy who wasn't picked? Joseph, also called Barsabbas, whose surname was Justice. Never heard of him again either. We saw another Barsabbas, but clearly a different guy. And we saw another Justice, but again, clearly a different guy. So that criteria for judging what the disciples did was a poor one. I think a lot of the criticism of the disciples in making this choice is really pointless. There are some questions, though, that we can ask and some lessons that we can learn. First, and this is a question that we'll ask frequently as we study our way through the book of Acts. Did they act in the spirit? Or in the flesh? Well, clearly the Spirit had not come upon them yet. That will happen in chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. But they all individually had the Holy Spirit. Jesus had breathed on them and said, receive you the Holy Spirit. And so they had access to the Holy Spirit, at least in some ways. But they did their best to work within God's principles and through prayer. And for us, that's a large part of what it means to walk in the Spirit. Do we pray before we make decisions? Do we search the Scripture for principles that will guide uh, what we're trying to decide, that will apply to what we're considering? In the end, do we seek to follow God's decision instead of our own? These are all things that the disciples did and that we should do in all of our daily decisions. That's how we walk in the Spirit. The second what about the second question? What about casting lots to let God decide? I've got two illustrations to talk about this. The first one, I remember one time on a, on a Mexico trip, summer Mexico youth trip, we were playing a game. It was girls versus boys. And it was a very simple game. You had to choose A or B, black or white, you know, whatever, one, one of two choices. Um, but what happened with that choice depended on what the other team chose. And the boys couldn't decide between their two options. You see, they were in a position where if they chose one option, 
they might be able to win the game, depending on what the girls did. They could win the game, end the game, and win it if the girls chose the way the boys wanted them to. But if the girls didn't choose the way the boys wanted them to, and the boys made that decision, they would lose the game. Boys didn't want to lose. The other option that the boys could choose was to choose a, 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 the other option, and they wouldn't win or lose. The game would just continue. Now, that sounds okay, except for the game had already gone on for hours. They really wanted to end it. So they were at a dilemma. Do we choose A with the idea that we might win, but we might also lose? Or do we choose B and let the game continue? And they, and they couldn't come to a consensus between them with the boys. And so they decided to cast lots. They prayed about it first, and then they flipped a coin, and then they chose. Were they wrong to cast lots? Well, some said it was, it was like gambling. Some said uh, that, that lots was an Old Testament thing and that we shouldn't do it today. I, I say it doesn't matter. You know why? Because the choice didn't matter. It was just a game. And either choice is equally good in the long run. The other example is I was watching a TV show the other day. And it was a historical, you know, factual documentary kind of TV show. And it, it was talking about uh, the dark side of letting God choose. In the Middle Ages, the courts used to do something called um, trial by ordeal. It worked like this. Let's say you were accused of stealing sheep, a capital offense. You could be, you could be hung for stealing uh, livestock. You would take an oath saying that you were innocent. You'd put your hand on a Bible or some holy relic, and you would swear to God that you were innocent. Then, they would heat an iron ball to red hot. And you would have to pick up that iron ball and run nine feet with it before you dropped it. Then they would wrap your hands in bandages. And then three days later, they would take off the bandages. If the skin of your hands was infected, then you were guilty and God had declared you guilty and you would be punished, probably hung. If the, hand, if the skin on your hands was not infected, then God had declared you innocent and you would be set free. Unfortunately, either way, guilty or innocent, you had just suffered a horrendous punishment for this crime that you may or may not have committed. Now, this trial by ordeal is horrible and inhumane in so many ways. But the Christians who thought it up thought it was a way to let God show who is innocent or guilty. And so in a way, it was a direct descendant of casting lots. The reason we don't cast lots today is that God has given his word, or they, has given us in his word, all the principles that we need for making wise decisions and judgments. And more importantly, he's given us the Holy Spirit as a guide in making a loving choice. Those Middle Ages judges thought they were pious in allowing God to direct a verdict, but they lacked the love that is the primary gift of the Holy Spirit. For the disciples, back in that upper room in the book of Acts, the outpouring of the Spirit is next week in our study. So I hope you'll join us for that study. But in the meantime, don't cast lots unless you have first used every principle in God's Word to make a wise and godly choice. And you're faced with two absolutely equal uh, uh, considerations. Okay, fine, cast lots. But don't be certain that God is going to direct that for you. Lots of people criticize the disciples for this episode of history, but no one should criticize the fact that they spent time in prayer, that they spent time in wise and godly counsel with each other, and that they spent time searching the scripture before they came to action. And that should be our primary lesson from all of this. We need to be like those disciples, patient and waiting for God's timing, full of prayer, full of desire to understand what God's word and God's principles say to us about all of our decision making. Now, next week, we're going to see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and everything changes after that. In the meantime, let's pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you for your word. And Lord, uh, although it's not for us to judge whether the disciples, because your word doesn't make it clear, whether the disciples were were wise or, or unwise in making the decision that they made and, and in um, casting lots for the selection of Matthias. But Lord, we do praise you and thank you that they did spend time 
in prayer, in study, uh, in, in um, seeking to be to draw near to you in this important decision, Lord. We pray that you would help us to be wise and strong in those same decisions. And we pray especially, Lord, for anyone uh, of the youth group or anyone who's listening to this message who has never personally received the Holy Spirit, that that uh, indwelling spirit who guides us in making decisions in wisdom and in love. Lord, I pray for that outpouring of the Holy Spirit on them. And of course, Lord, that depends on having put their trust in Jesus. And so if there's anyone hearing this, if you've never put your trust in Jesus, uh, why not cry out to him today? Ask him to receive you as, as his child, as his uh, adopted son or daughter, Lord. Ask them, ask him, Lord, uh, forgive me for I am a sinner and I need someone to pay the price for me. The price for my sin is death and I can't pay that. But Jesus already did. And ask him to, to put you on his account. Ask him, uh, thank him for paying the price for your sins and dying on the cross for you and ask him to cleanse you of all your sin and unrighteousness, and he will be faithful and just to do so. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. We love you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, and we look forward to seeing you guys next week. God bless you.